welcome hello welcome i am not wasting any time and ask my first speaker miss miti bilgam please go ahead with your topic thank you so much and thank you everybody for being here um and thanks to the faculty for inviting me because it's such a great honor for me to be here. It's my first time in India and it's a fantastic congress. Uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, umbilical hernia repair in patients with liver cirrhosis. And I think it's uh, an important subject and very interesting because I don't know, but I think all of you have been in this kind of situation where you are on call and you're just rounding up uh, the emergency department before you go home or go to bed. And uh, in enters this patient with the huge abdomen with acetus and uh, caput medusae and a strangulated umbilical hernia. And maybe uh, spiced up a bit with a skin perforation and acetus tapping out of it. And then you know it's just gonna be a very long night, right? So um, I've been in this situation a few times, and every time I was wondering why aren't these patients repaired uh, electively uh, in, in calm settings where they have minimal portal hypertension and, minimal, uh, and, and no uh, acetus. So uh, I started to dig into the literature, and uh, we performed this systematic review. Um, there was uh, a few uh, publications, but uh, fortunate, unfortunately, uh, we graded it with low level of evidence. But uh, the conclusions were that these patients have a threefold higher risk of emergency repair and a high risk of morbidity and mortality. And we knew that, of course, but uh, it also said that maybe uh, uh, elective repair seem safe if, if they have a low milk score or child A cirrhosis. So I was wondering, uh, how are we doing in Denmark? Because you know Denmark is a very small country and uh, we pay very high taxes. So uh, healthcare in Denmark is for free and you can have a hernia repair uh, without paying in a dime. And uh, so I, I was, I, my hypothesis was that we, we, we should do this better, right? Um, so we conducted this nationwide cohort study based on data from the Danish National Hernia Database. And it's a database covering uh, almost all hernia repairs performed in Denmark. Uh, every surgeon is obliged to enter uh, intraoperative details right after the hernia repair. And these data were combined with the unique National Civil Registry uh, providing data regarding uh, uh, all patients ad uh, admitted to the hospital with diagnosis, uh, surgical procedures, comorbidities, and so on. So the outcome of interest from in this study was uh, in mortality and intervention requiring complications and readmission within 90 days. So um, we uh, investigated uh, patients with the, with the liver cirrhosis undergoing umbilical hernia repair, emergency versus electively. And then we did another analysis where we propensity score matched these patients with, the, with other uh, severely comorbid patients. They were comorbid with uh, uh, regard to cardiac or respiratory uh, diseases. It, uh, we have this Chalson comorbidity index of three or more, which is similar. Um, yeah, and then we investigated the outcomes from cirrhotic patients and se uh, other severely comorbid patients. So uh, we, there was uh, 252 patients with cirrhosis and undergo, undergoing umbilical hernia repair, and most of them underwent open repairs, and 43% were performed as emergency repairs. So I thought it was very high because, you know, in, in Denmark at least, we have like the emergency repair for umbilical hernia is way below 10%. So we found that uh, elective repair uh, versus emergency repair, uh, the emergency repair had very uh, high mortality rates 
and very high rates of complications in terms of wound complications and liver-related diseases um, or complications, sorry. And of, of course, also a, a very high uh, readmission rate. So when we compared these patients to other severe comorbid patients, um, uh, these patients were uh, a little less, uh, underwent a little less emergency repair. Um, yeah, and the, uh, the mortality and uh, readmission were equal, but the uh, patients with liver cirrhosis had higher risk of intervention requiring complications. So what can we conclude from this uh, systematic review and the database study? We see a very high rate of emergency repairs in these patients, which is, uh, gives us a higher rate of mortality and higher rate of readmission and complications. Uh, and even when we compare them with other com uh, severely comorbid patients, these patients are very fragile and have higher risks of complications. So what should we do about it? Um, I love to have these little things that you can say, fix it while you can, because this is how I remember things. Uh, we started a prospective study now in Denmark um, where we asked our gastroenterologist to screen cirrhotic patients for umbilical hernia and refer them if they are, uh, have uh, low MILT scores or child A cirrhosis, and if they don't, we ask them to, uh, pre -op to optimize them, to, to downscale uh, the child puke, or optimize the liver function, and then we are very eager to perform elective repair on these patients. So I'm hoping that this will, uh, it, this is gonna help these patients for uh, having better outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you please uh, enumerate some of the major complications that you have encountered during this procedure? Major complications. Major complications. In post-operative period. Yeah, uh, major complications. There were, uh, I think we, there, was, there were not many, actually. Like? It, was, it was quite surprising uh, because I thought so. But um, I think uh, I remember it was equal. Okay. Do you there need were, there any, were no differences. Any, do you need any re-exploration after doing uh, uh, hernia surgery in cirrhotic patient? Any? Re-exploration. Uh, no, the, the, the re-interventions were mainly due to uh, surgical site infection or um, acetis, uh, acetis drainage and uh, gastroscopy due to uh, viruses, esophageal viruses. Okay, you have to chair the session as well, so please come to uh, come here and chair the session. Okay. Hello, everybody. Could we put the presentation on the screen, please? Thanks. We have been listening to talks on technical issues and we heard that you need to have a decent sized mesh and adequate fixation and you will have no recurrences. But the truth is after five years we do have 25% recurrences in incisional hernia repair. And we looked at this with a new approach. We looked at pulse loads. And pulse loads is the fight good against evil. And if you have the evil winning with just one pulse, you had a recurrence. And if you have a durable reconstruction, it will stand for years. And the basis of all this is continuum mechanics. It's the kind you restruct, you construct all kinds of um, compounds, like buildings, airplanes, cars, and so on. And they usually do not fail. So we look at the human body as a linked chain, and as you know, every chain is just as strong as the weakest link. So we need to look at all those forces, and each of the components needs to be analyzed, and at the end, it all comes down what happens at the mesh tissue interface, and this has been pointed out by Ramana in this talk back in 2021. 
So thanks, Ramana. So this is a bench test. We run this bench test in 10 years. We did 250 questions to be answered. And the result of this is a sliding or creeping motion between mesh and tissue. This is what happens at the mesh tissue interface. And here you see a clinical case, a recurrence one year after an IPOM, and the mesh walked away. And if you look at the tags, all the tags are lying flat on one side, like after a hurricane, a tree lies down with the direction of the wind blown. So you know how the force has acted, and now you need to think about why is healing not simply doing the trick. The point is, the freshly formed collagen is not really retaining well. This is a published, published data, and the fresh fibers have no shakedown. Shakedown is the settlement with cyclic force. They elongate, they get strength, and then they hold. If any component which is not, you have looked at a lot of meshes and you always saw some kind of detachment. This was never really modeled to the tissue. If any component between mesh, tissue, textile, and fixation breaks at one point, the whole thing will go away. And where is the load limit? The load limit is for each individual person, 45% of the individual maximum strength. And to cut it short, it's about 50 millimeters of mercury for 100 milliseconds. And if you look at our patients, we look at patients at risk. And if you look at them, one third coughs more than 400 times per day. So this is our limit. This will amount up to 180,000 coughs within one year. And the tissue, if it gets elongated, it gets stretched. And the stretched collagen fibers cannot retain. You saw this already. And the nerve fibers signal pain and the capillaries start to ooze. And this is why recurrences form, why hematomas form, seroma and pain and persistent pain occurs. And if we put a mesh in, we have to make sure that the mesh retains these forces. So Tulo and Debo published back in 2016 the mesh defect area ratio. Here it's for round mesh and round defect, but you can put it to every geometry you will find. And we put from this the mesh defect area ratio with the factorized components, so the influences. And the gained resistance to grip, the gained resistance to impacts related to pressure is this grip value. And it's been published, and we do have data on all kinds of meshes and fixations. Mesh is not mesh. It depends on the surface of the mesh. And each of those surfaces you can put coefficients to. And you see the variation is 1 to 14. So it's a high variation. The next step we did, we analyzed the individual patient with CT, abdomen with Valsalva. But we did not look at the hernia volume. We looked at the hernia area, the size of the hernia. And you see that the size of the hernia in this particular case triples during a Valsalva load. And if you look at the distortion zones down there, on the right-hand side, you cover them with a mesh 30 centimeters wide and 45 centimeters long. And you still have the edge of the mesh on a hotspot of distortion. And we have one recurrence in our database of 232 patients now. And this one recurrence is due to this mechanism. We operated on this patient 2019. And after this, we developed this kind of biomechanical analysis of the individual abdominal wall. We can share it because it's on a GitHub. And a GitHub is worldwide accessible. So this is a case of a 50-year old man with a forced recurrence after liver transplant. And these are his MR scans. It's 19 times 20 centimeters. And we did him with a grip-based concept in 240 minutes. He left the hospital, went back to work after 30 days, and he has no recurrence so far. So if you talk about how to do it, you assess hernia size and history. You wonder whether you have an incisional recurrent complex above 10 centimeters width. 
And then you look at it, if it increases under load, then you perform the CT abdomen, and then you calculate the critical resistance to impacts related to pressure. And once interoperatively, you should calculate what you gained during your technique. And if your critical is below your gain, you are in a durable area. This is when you look at published data during the last years in randomized studies, and you recalculate them, and you see very often the data fail to meet this CRIP divided by CRIP criterion. And once you reach above 100%, so GRIP is equal to GRIP, you fall below 10% recurrence rates. And this is what we have at the moment. In the non-registered hospitals in Germany, you do have frequent recurrences. And in the hernia centers, just recently published, you still have 25% after five years. And the stronghold group, it's 10 hospitals, 20 surgeons, experienced surgeons learn this concept within four hours. Unexperienced surgeons need about 70 cases to be proctored in. You get better results, and if you add CT abdomen with Valsalva to it, you end at the green line with one recurrence after three years in 170 plus patients. Thanks for your attention. The question how to avoid hernia occurrences means make a biomechanical durable repair. Thank you. Any quick questions? Greg Demanian, um, Metti, for the I have a meld 15 that I have to do as soon as I get home. I sent him to transplant, and they said, oh, yeah, good to go. We'll take care of him post-op. From your review of the literature, is there a better technical way to avoid complications? Or, I mean, it's an umbilical hernia and a serotic with ascites, or are they all the same? Did your literature review give me some hints on how to fix the hernia? I'll also try to put this on. Uh, we the the the, the patients uh, in in the database study there were no differences in in complications. I think there were the groups were too small, so we didn't see any differences between the different techniques. Was that from my point? Um, we do have transplant cases in this. We do have 30% recurrences immunocompromised um, chemotherapeutic patients, patients with um, about 20 times 20 centimeter hernias. And if you get them biomechanically stable, they will heal as long as the heart is beating strong enough so the patient survives anesthesia. You can do him, you can repair him biomechanically, and then he will be well. And you have a complication rate of about 2%. You know this from bone surgery. Once you, you get the bone stable, you can step on it. The day after surgery, you can walk away and it will heal. Same with the abdominal wall. So, Fred. Or a partially absorbable mesh. Type of can mesh. you please repeat the question on the mesh? So, does the type of mesh has any uh, effect on the outcome or on recurrence like hard mesh, soft mesh or uh, partially absorbable meshes in any type of hernia? If you look at the mesh, we use market approved meshes and then we characterize them and then we use them according to their characterization. So if you have a low gripping mesh, you must do a different procedure compared with a high gripping mesh. You know, a high gripping mesh has a better retaining force and can be applied according to the formula, for example, in a smaller size. Thank you, Frederick. Sir, I have a question. One small question. Uh, Sir, can you put please, some please. light? Last question. Okay. Last. Yes. Here, can you, you can discuss at the lunch hours. Okay. Okay, you just go through your question. La last quick question. Sir, can you just put some light on stable and unstable hernia? Stable and unstable. A stable and unstable? What? Hernia. Hernia. Or the abdominal wall that you explain in your this thing. Uh, I can't get your question. So stable and you unstable just discuss in personal. Fixation. 
Please. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frederick. So I'm going to. Thank you so much. Very glad to be here. And so I'm talking about progressive pneumoperitoneum, the PPP. Uh, no disclosures for this talk. So where are we now today in PPP? It was introduced in 1947 by Nyogi Moreno, published in uh, surgery. And uh, where do we stand in 2021? And we have this recent meta-analysis done and this review uh, article too. And in contrast with the longevity of the technique, the heterogeneity in the indications and technical variants is remarkable. And that is true because even now today, there is a lot, uh, there is a lot of difference between us. What volume, what, which gas, um, how do we do it? Um, for how long, uh, and these are, these are all things that are not very clarified in the, the literature and we need to step up and maybe uh, gain some, some you know, lit defined literature and come to some consensus that are lacking in the literature. It is an evasive technique and of course it can lead to serious complications hemorrhagic complications, bowel perforation, pneumomediastinum, uh, pneumothorax. Uh, there was a case that I found that described portal uh, pneumatosis after PPP. Subcutaneous emphysema, usually not a big deal, but uh, uh, um, actually more of a, a razor of uh, something is not that right. Respiratory distress, DVT, and in the literature, very rare, but I found three cases of death during PPP. So uh, in my unit, how do we do it, our protocol? And um, uh, I didn't put this for you to learn Portuguese because it's a little difficult, um, but just for you to see that we have everything written down. For today, uh, the material you use, how we do it, every step, so it can be reprodu reproductively and uh, um, one year from now, I can compare what I used to do with my new protocol if I have one. We use it on uh, loss of domain hernia, stanaka bigger than 0 0.25 or Sabbath, be, uh, greater than 20. We actually ca always calculate both. And we always do the DVT prophylaxis before. This is one of the cases, the usual cases that you, we always see in loss of domain, 60, six year old lady, Tanaka 0 0.7, and we did BTA four weeks prior to surgery, and then we had to do the uh, um, the PPP. How do we do it now? Uh, I use I, I've done it, uh, uh, I'm used to use ultrasound guided things. You know, I, I was born uh, as a surgeon to do ultrasound guided procedures in my previous hospital. Um, but still, uh, as complications, these are very complicated patients. Um, I prefer to go now with the various ultrasided, ultrasound guided, so it can be a little uh, 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 more safe. Puncture away from the sac, of course, uh, and heavy scarring away from two, built a safe uh, air pocket, and then introduce the uh, another needle with a CVC detector, and now we are going to have this various needle that we can use to put right away the Seldinger technique and don't uh, have to uh, puncture twice. And, and do not uh, do not want the catheter to stay in the earnest sac, you don't want pneumo in the earnest sac, always put the binder anyway, so you can really enlarge the abdominal cavity, that's what you look. and. And when you do the control CT skin, look for signs in the way where bowel behaves, seeing this CT where that bowel didn't came down. So, and in the surgery, that bowel was almost perforating the skin and I had to do enterotomy. And I was expecting this because I look at the CT and it was really odd how the only bowel that didn't come down was that one that have really severe additions. And sometimes it is not possible or is a very complicated patient, uh, or I tried to do it my way and I failed it. So I have my backup intervention radiology team. And um, 
It's very important to debrief with radiologists before if they don't know the procedure, because actually uh, I had this patient, it was for the last couple of years, it was the only complication we had with PPP. And it was, I asked radiology, I was not there, so I asked them to put a teacher, but someone that put it was not used to this procedure. So he put a pigtail, and as you see, he put it with the holes, some of the holes were in the abdominal wall. And this patient, he did PPP, and he started to develop emphysema, so uh, uh, I got in and I said, oh, this is not right, let's see and CT. The, the guy and he had actually what the PPP did is was destroying my abdominal wall, uh, the lateral abdominal wall. So now because of the PPP, I had even a bigger problem than before. And uh, I did operate on him, did a tar, reconstruct the, bo the bowel, and uh, you can see some asymmetry. At the end, it was not so bad, but this was really an unusual complication that should not have been happening. And sometimes even with the, the help of radiology, it can be tricky. You can see this patient, he had a big inlay interpretinal mesh, and um, we tried to do the PPP, but he only stays there, and we could, not, we could go from the side, but we could not understand it, what's going on. And in the, um, the surgery, I could understand because this was a, a mesh that I never seen, and it has like these two layers, so the PPP was getting in just in between these layers, and we could not get in the abdomen. Uh, so uh, the important questions really to address uh, regarding PPP uh, is uh, besides the way we do it, it, it doesn't matter, as long as you do it right, it can be you, it can be your team, it can be radiology, you can take him to the OR in difficult cases. Um, but the real question is, how long before surgery? Um, my protocol, I tend to, to do it 14 days before surgery. I schedule 14 days, and sometimes that gives me time to prep, to prep if things don't go the way I want it, so if patient cannot do it, uh, 14 days before, I still have some time until the 10th day, that's uh, usually my cutoff. How much air to go in? Uh, my protocol now is uh, I try to do three times the volume of the hernia. And sometimes, like in the first hernia that I showed, this can be a very huge volume. And even dividing into administrations can be tricky and the patient cannot tolerate it. So record everything. Uh, how much volume you are, you are installated every day. And uh, most of my uh, patients, they do PPP as outpatients, uh, and they go to outpatient clinic three times to check if everything is okay. But of course, they have my number, because if they start with weird symptoms or something is going wrong, they can reach me right away. And never forget antithrombotic prophylaxis, because that's really, really important. But this PPP is a game changer. You just need to use it right because in cases of loss of domain, sometimes with just the reefs, you can go for it. Thank you so much. I bring greetings from GM Hospital, Chennai. We all know the history. We have started with the open hernioplasty, drive stopa, then uh, remis, and then we had this laparoscopic IPOM, and much water has flown since then, since the era of uh, IPOM. Now we are into the endosco I mean, laparoscopic uh, TEPs, ETEPs, as well as STARS. But what's important is this has been the evolution, especially at our institute. And lap or laparoscopic IPOM is it's also, uh, I would say, a modified. Uh, abdomen wall reconstruction because it has a lot of advantages, especially in the form of uh, uh, lapless rule, which has, as the previous speaker pointed out, less tension on the mesh. With this evidence, we also uh, published our uh, suture closure repair followed by laparoscopic uh, ventral online repair. And we, uh, we even before the term laparoscopic uh, IPOM plus, we published in the year 2007. But we have a problem with the large ventral hernias because of the tension. The tension is the most important factor in producing high recurrence rates 
and that's where the component separation techniques have come into play. We have very many ways of reconstructing the abdomen in the midline, starting from open to endoscopic as well as retrorectus repair. <coughs> The objective of the component separation is to restore the structural and dynamic integrity and try to reconstruct in the midline along with minimizing the complications as well as optimizing aesthetic body contour. So there are very many ways of component separation starting from anterior to posterior with a combination of techniques that's been described in the literature. This is predominantly from the open literature. What I'm going to restrict myself is to have the component separation, which is predominantly an anterior one, where we divide the, uh, uh, the uh, junction of uh, the linea semilunaris to the external oblique and then make more way so that the tension following the laparoscopic eye palm can be reduced. And we gain a lot, four centimeter uh, uh, cranially, and then at uh, eight centimeter in the midline of the umbilicus, and then down, we are close to the suprapubic, we have three centimeter release on one side. And when, whenever there is, we find a large midline incisional hernias, recurrent and recurrent hernias, where the abdominal wall defects results from trauma or abdominal resection related to infection or malignancies, we resort, and this is one of the option, we resort as an adjunct to laparoscopic eye palm, along with other indications or Jane Omphalo seal. The endoscopic component separation has a lot of benefits with regards to the open uh, component, anterior component separation in the sense it reduces the skin flap necrosis as well as it avoids perforator injury. And these are the advantages in the interest of time. I'll go to directly to the video. We have two techniques when we can come from above or from below as well as we have in this hall is named after this. Ideally, uh, I'm speaking in this particular hall. We have the subcutaneous as well as subfacial, and what we do is create a nice tunnel, identify the junction of the aponeurosis and the muscle, divide it, and then we go. See, suppose this is, I'll start the video. This is a, a large hernia, about a 12 centimeter uh, defect, where the de uh, closure sometimes may be difficult. We, even if you close, sometimes there may be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, problems with uh, uh, the, uh, the tension, that's how we resort to anterior component separation. This is under vision, we using a VC port. We go first on to the left side, it's either unilateral or bilateral, subcostal uh, inc small incision under vision. We, we stop stop of uh, the subcutaneous plane, camphor and scarpa fascia, and then we go on to the bang on to the uh, anterior surface of the fascia. We create a nice tunnel in the subcutaneous plane. The beauty of this procedure is we know we, it's always one, most of the time, one instrument is enough. The surgeon himself or herself hand can handle the camera and uh, we can always move the instrument. It's a zero degree camera and it's, it's predominantly a simple 10 to 12, 15, 15 minutes procedure on one side. We can go all the way up to the inguinal ligament and then at the junction of uh, the aponeurosis and the muscle, we divide it lateral to the linea semilunaris and then we create uh, the plane between the rect uh, external and the internal oblique up in, up, um, I mean muscle so that we have a nice release onto the um, uh, midline so that midline closure can become easy. So this is, you can see, uh, fairly avascular, fairly easy, fairly reproducible, and so that the muscle can be released onto the other side. We can go all the way up to the subcostal region onto the inguinal uh, ligament, so that the more we divide, the more we create the space, the better about 10 centimeter of uh, mobilization can be achieved. As I can see, I'm coming proximally also, so that uh, we can go all the way up to the subcostal region, the entire, of course, in the superior aspect, a little bit of uh, less distance we gain, but at the umbilicus in the periumbilical region where majority of our work will be, it we can gain. We can see clearly the muscle, that's the internal oblique muscle. So this is uh, the on one side, the interest of time, this is on the opposite side. First we have done the left side, now we have gone to the right side. The same thing, the support technique will go to the opposite side and then <coughs> do the same bit. You can see uh, one instrument, one working instrument is enough in majority of the patients so that 
we just incise it clearly we can see what's uh, uh, the the junction of course we can also use a pre operative marking so that we cut it and then once we go in we have lot of uh, space the tension is reduced so that the this is one of the recurrent hernias where we have done uh, a component separation followed by laparoscopic eye palm so that's about uh, uh, we also got the publications, even the most difficult situations like uh, the uh, bariatric surgery along with the component separation. And obviously, comp endoscopic component separation is better than open component separation. And we have been using this from 20 to th even before the ETEP came, since 2015 we have been using. So my conclusion is definitely even in the era of abdominal wall reconstructions and ETEPs and so on, I would say that it's a good adjunct for a large ventral hernias easy to adapt, easy to reproduce. It has some potential to make it big. My only thing is that there I could see a obvious hesitation on the herniologist to embrace this simple, safe, effective, reproducible technique without any modern energy sources being required. That's my take on it. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions if any. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the topic which I have today is uh, lower segment cesarean scars hernia. And uh, I have chosen this topic specifically to highlight a couple of points to differentiate from the commonly performed uh, surgeries in the groin. Because this is relevant only to the females and we have a very large population who is having multiple uh, surgeries or multiple cesarean sections. So I would just uh, highlight six important points how a LSCS hernia should be uh, different from any other groin hernia in this area. So why LHCS hernia is different because of the location and anatomy which is related to the pelvis. And unlike the other ventral hernias of the abdominal wall, this is not a location where one would be uh, convenient to perform a simple eye palm or a eye palm plug. Not only that, when the patient presents to us in the outpatient clinic, sometimes there is a bulge on the cesarean section scar and it is not 100% sure that this patient is having a hernia because even on the scan the findings are not very clear and it has to be differentiated from either a stitch granuloma, a local infection or more commonly an endometriosis or an endometriotic scar in that area. Also in some of the elderly women or a obese women with a uh, a pendulant abdominal wall, the hernia may not be very distinct and it remains neglected and increases in size subsequently. So you can see in some patients that the uh, impulse on coughing is very clear, but it may not be so in some other patients. So as I said, that the symptoms in these patients may not be characteristic of a hernia symptom, but they may complain of lower abdominal pain or some signs of subtle obstruction, which may be coming from the findings inside as well. The points I would like to highlight in this is which approach should be done and what are the internal findings that we will find specifically in patients of LSCS. So if you are suspecting this patient is having a incisional hernia, which approach would you prefer? you need to differentiate what are the exact findings on imaging and on examination. If you are sure that this is a hernia defect, you need to decide whether it is a central hernia or a lateral hernia. And depending upon the need for the placement of the mesh, you would prefer to have a standard tap approach. But if this patient also has some simultaneous umbilical hernia or a divarication which may need attention, then perhaps an uh, ETEP may be approved. And as I said, if you are not sure of the diagnosis and you may suspect that it needs a wide excision, then a simple open approach with a phanelstein incision would be better. You would definitely find additions like in any incisional hernia. And there would be omentum, bowel, or any other uh, tissue which might be added in. And this is compounded by the fact that it is present or the additions are going into the pre-peritoneal uh, fat which is present near the pelvic area and the uh, thing. 
Another thing which may be very obvious is the additions to the uterus. Now, sometimes you may have visible sutures which may be seen on the uterus. But more importantly, what we find difficult is that if this kind of additions of the uterus are present on the abdominal wall, the normal preperitoneal plane which is created by raising the peritoneal flap is not so clear and distinct because when you do the additional lysis of the uterus, along with it, the peritoneum also comes down. So there is no place which we normally see between the peritoneum and the uterus lying down. So when you are raising or doing the additionalizes of the uterus, along with it, the peritoneum is also simultaneously coming down. So after the mesh plasty, when you are going to anchor the peritoneum back to the abdominal wall, you are likely to encounter more problems. So, once you finish the dissection, this is a case where there was a defect in the midline. But this may not be so all the time. You are likely to have defects which are present on the lateral aspect. And I have seen commonly some very big hernias coming from the lateral part of the LSCS scar which are going into the left preperitoneal area and the left side. So when you are doing the dissection after the contents are being reduced, you have to give a complete display lower down till both the sides of the Cooper's ligament are distinctly displayed. This is one of the most important problems which is seen in cases of uh, um, lower hernias where uh, you need to identify the bladder correctly. Uh, this is not displaying, but in my uh, movie, I have uh, clearly demonstrated that you fill the bladder with saline and then you see where the bladder is located so that you can decide the extent of the placement of the mesh and have a good plane between the two. Now, unlike in the other groin hernias, especially inguinal or femoral, where we do not close the defect, the defects of the LSCS scar or any kind of a final steel incision scar are preferably closed once you have uh, highlighted and displayed the anatomy of the bladder completely because it will give you a very nice place, plane for the placement of the mesh. Now, coming to the choice of the mesh in this area, if you think that the mesh will not be entirely covered by the peritoneum, you use the mesh which you use for a normal IPOM plus case and an absorbable or a ventralite or one of those meshes which are coated are used. And the lower end of the mesh is tagged to the Cooper's ligament without having any tackers on the bladder area. And the proximal uh, uh, part of the mesh is uh, adherent to the abdominal wall, but you suture or tack the peritoneal flap back, and there may be a situation that you'll find a gap between the peritoneum and the mesh, which has to be securely closed to prevent any bowel from herniating in the, uh, through this defect into the pelvis. Anchorage of the mesh is extremely important to prevent the migration of the mesh. And as I showed, the lower end of the mesh under all circumstances should be tacked to the bony uh, points and the gap should be closed completely. To conclude, there are some differences between the standard groin hernia and incisional hernia of the lower abdomen. Care of the bladder and uterine additions is emphasized and the choice of the mesh has to ma be made uh, and all options should be available in the operation theater while tackling this segment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.